What's up, my wizards? It's Dev and Ziggy here from SBMTG. We like magic. And you know what? Last time I gave the patrons a bunch of decks to vote on, I gave them all kinds of crazy combo, mid-range control things that are super unique and synergistic, but none of them cared about that. They just wanted to, they just wanted to stomp. So today, get, sorry for scaring you there, Ziggy. You're ready for the mighty, mighty mono green. Here we go. Oh, oh, excuse me. I was just counting through all the rewrites we've had to do on this deck. It's 15, just so you know. This was a tough deck to put together because there's so many ways to, like, theory craft mono green right now, you know. It turns out that there's at least three or four or five different stompy decks you can put together right now, so it's all about determining which one is the best one. So, before I go into the... Hey, Ziggy. Hey, bu my Bubba loves me. So, before I go into the actual deck tech, what I really ended up on here, let me just address some ways you could build this deck and why we didn't. Well, the first thing I want to address is the potential Lovestruck Beast build and the question of whether or not this card is worth playing in mono green anyway, and ultimately I decided it's not to my taste. You want to play Lovestruck Beast in your mono green, knock yourself out, kid. I'm proud of you. I think you're cool either way. But I kind of feel like this card requires us to play a bunch of like below curve one ones and stuff, and that's more of a Selesny Adventures steez. They get to play like Edgewall Innkeeper and take advantage of that. It's a really nasty magic card. We don't necessarily get to do that unless the only value we want to get off of Innkeeper is Lovestruck Beast, and I'm just, that's not the boat I want to be in, Padna, so at the end of the day, I just decided a vanilla 5-5 is not worth 12 slots being taken up in our deck by 1-1s. So then I got to thinking, how about we try to go as fast as possible? We're in a really mid-range format right now, full of Okos, Teferis, Golos, Field of the Dead, Just Sky Fire, so a pretty mid-rangey combo control format, but a lot of those decks don't really do much in the early turns. A lot of them don't even really play, like, satisfactory removal, so I felt like the best way to exploit that would just be to go underneath them, try to make the deck as quick as possible, but that's also bad, you know? You get to play, like, Wildwood Tracker in that version of the deck, which does go kind of nicely with Lovestruck Beast, but again, in the end, this is not very high impact. I would have sworn to you that a one mana 2-2 two -two effectively was going to be worth playing in a Stompy deck, but at the end of the day, it didn't turn out to be super effective, along with cards like Giant Growth that I was really excited about playing in this deck. It just didn't, mm, just didn't really pan out. I even tried Rose Thorn Halberd. I had some high hopes for proving people wrong on that card. Turns out it's... It is, in fact, bad, and so is this whole strategy of going underneath, because it turns out that green just has, like, way too many good mid-range and even late-game options to really pass up in this color combination, and drawing, like, a Wildwood Tracker on turn six is the... It feels very bad in comparison to drawing some of the things you could be drawing, because right now I don't think this deck is really capable of finishing a game on turn four consistently. It can do it, just not consistently enough to make that the highest priority. I think we do want a little bit more mid and late game play, and that requires sacrificing some cards like Giant Growth and Wildwood Tracker that we can just be doing better things than those cards. So, all that said, what did we end up on? Well, I'm kind of sorry to say, this did turn out to be a Nissa deck. I'll have you know, I was really resistant to putting Nissa in the deck to begin with. I wanted to make this, again, a fast deck that hits hard, like the Stompy decks I remember from, like, Urza's block standard. <laughs> just super fast, hard to deal with Stompy decks, but I'm just not sure we have the tools in the format right now to make that deck as consistent as it needs to be. Like, you know, another problem is that I want to play, like, Wildwood Tracker, and I want to play Surferin, but they're terrible on curve next to each other, you know? Like, there's so many, like, kinks and issues that need to be worked out in the fast aggro version of Stompy that in the end I felt like all the quirks just weren't necessarily worth it. You know, like, Pell Collector and Wildwood Tracker don't play very well with each other in the early game. Again, so many quirks, and I just decided to throw it all out because it wasn't consistent enough, and it turns out, if you have access to a card like Nissa, hate to admit it, but you should, you should probably just play her. I mean, again, I feel a little defeated here because I wanted to prove that a fast Stompy deck was possible, and it may still be. I'm not, obviously, I'm just some guy on a couch, right? I mean, I'm not the end-all, be-all, but at the same time, I felt like, in the end, the more mid-rangey, Nissa-centric version of the deck was much better and did, in the end, perform a lot better for me. But that doesn't mean I'm not playing, like, little guys down there at the bottom of the curve, because they're also playing Pell Collector, who won't stay a little guy for very long. A lot of ways to grow Pell Collector in the current format. I mean, 
We say that every time a new set drops, right? Oh, it's a Pell Collector's time to shine. And now that the card pool has gotten dramatically shallower, it seems a little backwards to say that Pell Collector might finally work. But there are so many good pieces introduced for Mono Green that it kind of doesn't matter what left the format. <laughs> you know, He's got so many good new creatures for Pell Collector to work with that it is very easy to grow this thing on nearly every turn of the game that it's out. That's because you got a lot more, like, pelts laying around in this format than you did last format. You know, you got giant pelts and questing beast pelts and goose down pelts uh, just walking around it's i guess he doesn't grow any off of gilded goose but we are going to play four copies of gilded goose regardless i mean that's like the only truly bad synergy in the deck is <laughs> gilded goose plus pelt collector but goose is so good to have laying around that you might as you really ought to play it this is another card i was resistant to when i first started building the deck i just i didn't think that goose was gonna go in but Turns out it's just, it's good, you know, it's not Lana War Elves or Birds of Paradise for that matter, long stretch, but still, getting the ability to play a three drop on turn two, or four drop on turn three, even just once in a game, is good, that's good magic, brother or sister, so, turns out, just for that reason, you might as well put this in, but there are, there's other good things about it, it turns out that just like making food once you don't need the mana anymore, it's kind of good, you know, if you're in like a, an aggro matchup or even a mid-range mirror of some kind, then just the extra food this can provide as a mana sink is, is not bad some of the time, it turns out. And in that way, its utility lasts long after a creature like Lana War Elves or even Birds of Paradise. You know, just the ability to make food is sometimes a lot more important than you might think. And the initial ramp is incredible every single game. So I tentatively included four copies of Gilded Goose on like the seventh or eighth rewrite. And it just turns out you want to be on the card. Now, moving into the two drops, we come to what is subtly one of the hardest decisions you have to make when building the deck, and that is do we play Barkai Troll or Wildborn Preserver? Now, ultimately, ended up on Preserver. I like Barkai Troll's starting stats a lot more, and it's a lot easier for, the, for this to get through like an Arboreal Grazer in the early game. So I, I do like Barkai, but Preserver just ends up getting enormous. Over the course of the game, gives us a built-in mana sink for any creatures that we might play. Makes awkward turn sequences a lot better, you know? If you've only got a two-drop, but you have three mana, that happens some of the time, and it turns out, just turn that into an extra counter on Wildborn Preserver. There's also the fact that if you have two Wildborn Preservers, you can do some funky stuff on your opponent's turn by playing one, then immediately, you know, playing the other one and growing the first one that you played, depending on how much mana that you have. So there's a lot of cool tricks with this, a lot of reasons to play multiples for that matter. And even though the starting stats aren't great, flash and reach are, and the fact that, yeah, this starts as a 2-2, but it's going to be a 5-5 super fast, <laughs> it definitely makes it a better card than Barkai Troll, in my opinion. But moving into the three drops here, we're going to play three copies of our Vo. My Vo and your Vo, actually. Um, this guy's the leader at Garenbrig because he's good at getting big. This guy's this guy is huge, like super fast. Just within a couple of turns, this guy will be astronomically large. And I, I like the flavor on it. I've determined that the flavor is like whenever a new guy comes into town, he's like, you think you, you, think you got more pump than me? <laughs> you know, just, Ooh. And he just swells up a little bit more. I think it's super cute flavor, but it also translates into really sweet game functionality. We've all been lamenting the loss of a card like Galta for the last month or so now, but this replaces it pretty well. You're almost guaranteed to get this on turn three in every single game, unlike Galta. And within just a couple of turns, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be even bigger than Galta. I won't have the trample or anything, but we can... There are the ways in this deck to give a trample, so keep that in mind. This is just... This, this has gotten bigger than my opponent's starting life total a bunch of times <laughs> in testing. So if you take nothing more away from this card, just remember that little factoid because this is easily the biggest creature in the deck at pretty much all times. And that's what green wants, especially for three freaking mana. I mean, a three mana four, four is good enough stats in most cases. You know, I was talking about Lovestruck Beast, and I was like, oh, it's just the three mana 5-5, five, five, who cares, right? But I also slipped in the phrase, with no abilities. So when it comes to stuff like Yorvo that scales hugely over the course of a game, or Questing Beast, which might be 
technically smaller at a higher mana cost than a card like Lovestruck Beast. It doesn't matter. This is just easily one of the best cards in the format right now. I didn't want to believe this card was as good as it is, because at the end of the day, it does kind of come down to a 4-mana four 4-4, four, four, but it, <laughs> there's just a bunch of other words on the card, and it turns out they almost all matter, except for the one line about, like, fog effects, but that might matter eventually, right? <laughs> Mostly. this The fact that this has haste is kind of the biggest deal in the card, but it's kind of amazing how well these three abilities work in conjunction with one another because vigilance and haste and haste is really sweet you know it's got haste you can swing with it the turn it comes out but you didn't actually you know lose any defense you know you, you get offense and defense out of this card and the death touch is like really spicy gravy too and it works kind of well with the vigilance as a matter of fact so just like all the abilities in this card are ridiculous <laughs> You know, the fact that it just eats to fairies and okos and stuff alive. You know, you can swing it on your opponent, still hit the planeswalker. So that's important. The fact that it can't be blocked by like little dudes. That's so, it's all crazy. Like this card, all the abilities work together so well that I'll say it again. This is like one of the best cards in standard and kind of the other best reason to be in green. So we'll play all four copies. I don't care that it's legendary this time. Now, we are playing a couple more big creatures, but I want to pause for a second let you know that we're playing four copies of P. Diddy. Paradise Druid is still a great two-drop. I mean, it's still that good. And I'm playing it over Barkhide Troll here because, yeah, Barkhide Troll is a lot more speed in terms of stats and all that. But we're trying to get to Nyssa and a couple of, like, big giant creatures if we can help it in this deck. So the fact that we can still go, you know, turn three Nyssa in this deck, just like we could in the last format, is such... A huge deal that I felt like we did need Paradise Druid. So we can do that sequence, you know, Gilded Goose into Paradise Druid into Nyssa. It's still a possibility, and I felt like that sequence was so much stronger than just about anything else we could be doing that I wanted it available to us. So that said, this can also ramp us into like a turn three questing beast, and there's nothing nothing wrong with that. I'm I'm playing Paradise Druid. You can't stop me. But Pete Drizzle also helps for playing these huge creatures that are at the top end of our curve here. I figure we're playing Nyssa, so we should probably throw in some payoffs for playing Nyssa in the first place. If you untap with a Nyssa in play, you're going to have access to a lot of mana, and it's best to be able to use that as efficiently as possible, and use all of it if possible. So I've got a couple of big X creatures to head up the curve here, starting with Voracious Hydra. Tough call this, here between this and Wicked Wolf, but in the end, we aren't playing as many food synergies as a deck like Simic or Bant Food, or Soul Tie Food, for that matter. So I just felt like Hydra was a better card, especially considering, again, we're really focused around Nyssa. So being able to dump all our mana into it and just double the counters on it on a board where we don't have to kill a creature, that's an important bit of versatility that w Wicked Wolf doesn't have. And of course, worst comes to worst, we can still kill a creature with Voracious Hydra and usually end up with a bigger creature than a 3-3. So all things considered, I felt like this was the much better option than Wolf, but I'm not opposed to just running both of them if you can find the slots. But to finish off the creatures here, I'm playing two copies of our secret weapon, Stone Coil Serpent. Call this thing Metal Gear because this is one solid snake. American <laughs> jokes, but still. This card is actually incredible. You know, like I said before, we're in a format full of Okos that just can't do anything about. Oko can't steal this, can't turn it into a boring 3-3 or whatever, so that's important right there, but it also slips right up under Teferi, can't be blocked by Hydroid Crisis, can't be killed by, like, Tyrant Scorn. There's a, there's a lot of reasons to run Stone, Stone Cold uh, Serpent right now. It's a very hard word for me to say. There's a, lot, there's a lot of reasons to run Serpent right now. And the fact that this will fill out our, you know, three-drop slot in the curve, you may have noticed we're a little thin there, but, you know, as a three-mana three-three with all of these abilities, with three different abilities, that's actually not a bad rate. But, if you are able to play at the turn after you play your Nissa and you play an 8-8 with all these crazy abilities, and suddenly you've easily got the best creature on the table, friend. <laughs> but on to the spells here. Some of the most important cards in our deck this time around, which you don't often get to say in a mono green deck, but I've already shown you the Nissa. She's maybe the most important card in the deck. But another important planeswalker that we're running is Vivian Arcbow Ranger. This thing is dude, nuts. This thing is absolutely crazy. It turns out just a plus one on this is enough to win a bunch of games. I say that from experience, you know, the fact that not only can this distribute counters by plussing, I mean, what, that's so good, but also giving creatures trample, huge deal in this deck, especially when we have stuff like Yorvo that we'd really like to give trample, you know, you have a 15-15 Yorvo, you'd really like to give that sucker trample, so Vivian's good at doing that. She's also a removal tool a lot of the time, it's pretty sweet with Yorvo, again, I'll bring that card up. This all of the first couple of abilities in the card are good enough, but the fact that you can fetch up a creature out of your sideboard is pretty sweet, some of the times too because that it's just card advantage 
<laughs> the, the card does everything green needs to be able to do all in one planeswalker and we can ramp into it pretty consistently the card is just bananas and even gets like gilded goose swinging for damage in the air some of the time it's just i'm telling you i don't know if you think this is a bad card try it out it's ridiculous I'm also working in one copy of the Great Hinge. I really would like to, but I don't I don't know that we actually need that. There have been a lot of games where the Great Hinge doesn't actually do much for me once it's down. You know, it just, it just ramps you, gains you some life. I mean, that's fine. The best thing this does is draw your cards. You know, but that's kind of all it needs to do most of the time. Most of the time when I play this card, I just want to draw more cards. You know, just, okay, creature, draw creature. Yes, creature, draw creature. Ah, land, damn it. That's kind of how it usually goes once you get a hinge down. But the fact that it also gives you, you know, a plus one, plus one counter on every creature that you play. I mean, it's all good gravy, but it's not the kind of gravy that I want to necessarily, like, run the risk of drawing twice in the same game. And a lot of games, you don't even have to draw it once. So, like, it's a super silly magic card in Commander, and it is a silly magic card in Standard, but... I'm surprised to say that I really don't think the deck needs to play any more than one, and you could probably get away with playing zero. I just, I like to have fun when I play Magic, so I'm playing a copy. But finishing off the main deck here, we're running three copies of Once Upon a Time. You knew it would be in the deck somewhere, it's just how many copies is the big question. You know, if you guys saw the, the first results from Standard, the ones with all the, the Golos, Selesny, and Golgari adventures, um... So, just Guy Fires was in that mix. You'll note that a lot of the green decks, I mean, they, they pretty much all play once upon a time, but there's some that are playing one. There's some that are playing three. There's some that are playing four. So it's, it's kind of up to your discretion, and we haven't figured out the right number, but kind of the rule of thumb I've been going by when building decks with once upon a time in them, because this is the third deck that I built this season, <laughs> once upon a time is in it, is if you have cards you'd rather play, just play those, you know? <laughs> I was playing four, but I wanted to play a Great Hinge. So I just played that instead. You know? <laughs> because you don't really want to draw more than the one of these in your opening hand. You, you know, like, or throughout the game. Like, it's a fine top deck on turn six, turn seven. Especially if you have a Nissa in play, it's very likely you can play this and then still play whatever you actually got with it if you got a big meaty creature or something. So it's not dead on turn six, turn seven when you top deck it late at the top, <laughs> top deck it. Woo, late in the game, <laughs> it's not such a bad card, but at the same time, it is best on turn one, and you don't want to draw too many more copies in that first one, so I felt like three was ultimately the right number, at least, again, to my tastes. There's a, there's a lot of accounting for tastes in the mono green deck right now. There's a lot of different ways to build it, but in the end, I just didn't feel like the deck needed all four copies of this card, and that's probably best for the budget, too. Now here's our mana base, and it's not too complicated here, but we do get to run one fewer lands than I would usually feel comfortable running in a deck like this. Mostly in due in large part to a card like Once Upon a Time. It really lowers the land count, because if you get it on turn one, it almost guarantees a land if you need that. So if you're on a two lander and you need your third land, Once Upon a Time helps with that. Paradise Druid helps out too. And to a lesser extent, Gilded Goose, although you don't necessarily want to eat a food to make up for a missed land drop. That feels pretty bad but at the same time <laughs> i think 23 lands is fine and it's one of the few aspects of the deck that has not changed like hardly at all during testing and yeah you want all four cops to castle garen brig that's a disgusting magic card once you get to a certain point in the game and you really only want the one copy of gingerbread cabin because it's only decent later on in the game and even then it's only kind of decent and i was rocking two copies of this but i really never ever ever ever, ever want to miss curving out because I had, you know, two forests and a gingerbread cabin in my opening hand. So in the end, I felt like one is all we really needed to play, but I didn't want to cut it down to zero. But here's our sideboard, starting with the four copies of Veil of Summer, the most slam dunk, no-brainer call in the entire deck as far as I'm concerned. This is another one of the few aspects of this list that has never once changed in testing. Always all four Veil of Summer. It's a repulsive magic card, but let's move on to the more nuanced stuff. Like Crawl Harpooner, I wanted some number of this so we can take out big flyers in game two. But sometimes we can even do it in game one, thanks to Vivian. So, And usually we can search up Crawl Harpooner at the point in the game where it's actually relevant and can kill stuff <laughs> once we get our Vivian down. So important to remember. But there's also Thrashing Brontodon, which can destroy target Golos or Fires of Invention and a bunch of other stuff right now. So it'll come out of the board and even sometimes happen along in game one if you have a Vivian out, so keep that in mind. But it's also shifting Ceratops, again, keeping a theme of cards, creatures specifically, that are good in game two against specific decks, but not 
you know, they can come out in game one, again, if you get a Vivian, so keep that in mind. So, against decks that play a bunch of Teferis and other blue cards and whatnot, Shifting Ceratops, you have access to, technically, in game one. We've also got a God Eternal Ronus. This is when we're getting into the stuff that we want to, you know, Silver Bullet and pull out with a Vivian, if possible. God Eternal Ronus has the possibility of just winning us the game immediately. You know, I was playing Return to the Wild Speaker in this slot, but I'd much rather just have something that we can pull out of our sideboard. Anytime we want in game one with a Vivian. That seems much better to me than having to play a non creature card. Even though I love Return of the Wild Speaker, turns out that God Eternal Ronus just like also finishes the game immediately and, and provides a body on the battlefield. So I'll just, I'll just play that instead, right? So <laughs> let's do that. But there's also the fourth copy of Voracious Hydra in the sideboard. We can also pull this out game one if we need to with Vivian. And sometimes that will be important, but in the creature based matchups, this will always come in. So keep that in mind. And then finally, one single copy of Vivian Champion of the Wilds. This will come in against more control oriented decks that actually do play like, counter spells and stuff. <laughs> like a lot of removal. Because this is not only a card advantage tool, but also a way to play your creatures at instant speed, both of which are great modes against control decks. So amazing card there, but I really didn't feel like we could play too many copies of it. But here are your power rankings right here. A final score of 66. Not too shabby for a mono green stompy deck. That said, the deck does have some of its problems. You know, the fact that it's a 66, I think is actually pretty illustrative of where it really is in the tier list right now. Not the strongest deck, but nowhere near the weakest deck and can mop the floor with a bunch of stuff right now. If your opponent's trying to play an aggro deck against you, this is usually going to be a good call. It has had its, some of its problems against cavalcade decks in testing, but for the most part, decks that are trying to play creatures are not very good <laughs> against this deck. It's, However, when we get into those Golos decks, we have a little bit of a problem because we don't really have too many answers to what that deck is trying to do. And even though we do have some long game stuff like Voracious Hydra, Nissa, for instance, their long game package is much more versatile than ours is. So we do have some blind spots right now. Let me just point that out, but still a really solid deck at the end of the day that even though it's not budget by any stretch of the imagination, it's still going to cost you a lot less than a lot of these big decks out there. And if you're playing it on Arena, it'll carry you through gold and even some of Platinum pretty easily, or at least that was my experience. So, Hope you enjoyed this deck tech. If you want to check out this deck, look at the first link in the description. Hop on over to TCG Player and check out the deck list. Check out any, you know, pick up any pieces that you might need. Lowest prices on the interwebs and actually helps your boy out when you order cards. So do that if you want to. But otherwise, it's helping me out for this for this quality YouTube content that I bring you three, four times a week. It's just like the video. It takes like two seconds. Puts me in more recommended feeds. And boy, do I. Do I need that right now? So help me, help me out, boys and girls. I need, I need all of you to Captain Planet, Spirit Bomb. Help me out. Hit that like button. Subscribe if you haven't done it yet. That would also help my YouTube metrics. And again, I need that. And uh, yeah, do the other stuff. If you haven't joined the Patreon yet, just a dollar a month of, of order of small fries a month in the Patreon pot. We'll let you vote on what decks you want to see next. So, you know, if you saw me put all those decks on screen, at the end of the last deck tech, and you wanted to see Abzan Adventure or something. And now we're doing Mono Green Stompy. Well, you should have put, should have put a dollar in the Patreon pot. You could have affected the voting. But anyway, I think I'm pretty sure I'm at the end of this one. Let me know how you felt about it because there's a million ways to build this deck right now. Like I said, a million rewrites. There's more rewrites than on the sheet of paper, like per sheet of paper. Like one, two, three, four on this one sheet of paper. Uh, five, six. 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, if you see all of those, and then um, 12, 13, 14, and then the actual notebook that I use is 15. So again, 15 rewrites for this deck. There's a lot of ways to build it. Let me know how you do it down there in the comments section, and I will catch you cats later. I'm Deb from The Place. Thanks for watching, my wizards. Spread love and be kind. <laughs>